Well, this is relatively rare. This is about you know, five people per hundred thousand. What we predict, a sinister sort of outlook would be uh, mainly swallowing difficulties, not oh. being able to, choking on food, that sort of thing. It requires more effort for you to get up and walk about from A to B. Yeah. If your sleep isn't ideal, then you're going to be more tired in the day. Generally, fatigue can be an element because it's more of a, a, a physical struggle to do simple things like dress, right. wash, all the that. And the prognosis? Is the prognosis the one that is, you know, normal, which is... Well, there are patients who go 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a more aggressive illness than, say, bland Parkinson's. And there's no treatment? There are symptomatic and supportive treatments, but that's with Parkinson's. Treatments there are symptomatic. Right. They're not curative. Right, the the yeah, so the older statistics, when it was unrecognized and people would only see the more severe cases, would say somewhere up to five to ten years. It's the little things they don't tell you. For 17 years, I slept on my right side, observing the gentle rise and fall of my wife's breasts as I drifted off to sleep, ready to spring out of bed should my daughter want reassurance during the night. Now I am unable to move my body. I lie on my back, looking at the gantry hoist and fittings that help me get up. These are my thoughts, but this is not my voice. Multiple system atrophy, or MSA, has robbed me of my speech now as well as my mobility. I must quietly occupy the space between other people's conversations. Silence is how I lead my life nowadays. It's a bit far down. Okay. Oh. My name is Gregory Wilston, and although MSA has stolen the use of my body, I am still the same person on the inside. On the 29th of September 2016, I was diagnosed with multiple system atrophy a terminal, degenerative, neurological condition similar to Parkinson's, but faster and more devastating. So multiple system atrophy is a degenerative disease and it's caused by protein problems in the brain and as the name suggests, multiple system atrophy. It affects many different areas of the brain and depending on which particular areas a patient may present with different symptoms. But essentially there are two main types. One is Parkinsonian-like, so perhaps with a tremor. But there's another type which is what we call MSAC, which is the cerebellar type. Now the cerebellum is another part of the brain which is involved in fine motor control, um, helping you balance when you're walking and standing up. And if that is affected, obviously people become very unsteady on their feet and can have falls and have problems generally in moving. I first experienced symptoms of MSA 12 years ago. It came as a shock because I'd recently had an MRI scan which was normal and I had discussed this with my GP on the phone feeling quite relieved. But once diagnosed after further testing, I realized that various worrying ailments that I had put down to advancing middle age over the previous 10 years were in fact early signs of MSA. It leads to certain nerve cells dying, which can cause a whole range of different symptoms. The early symptoms are what we call autonomic, and that means that it affects the, the nerves to the, the bladder and bowel, the nerves to the blood vessels, and some, to some extent, nerves that affect how well we sleep. 
So the first symptoms may be related to bladder function. It may be urgency, having to rush to get to the toilet. And sleep involvement can lead to this, this odd syndrome that people have called REM sleep behavior disorder. And that's where people start acting out their dreams. So while they're asleep, they may start shouting or, or fighting off the baddies. And that can lead to problems with the person sleeping next to them getting walloped in the middle of the night. So this constellation of symptoms are often the, the first things that, that a patient experiences because of the autonomic nerves being affected. So the protein that causes the problems in Parkinson's disease is called alpha-synuclein. Multiple system atrophy also involves this protein. What happens in MSA is it's some of the support cells that are actually affected. Protein accumulates, these are the little brown blobs. So in these areas where the if you like, the wiring is compromised, function is compromised. So in this case, we're talking about movement control. The transmission of signals down these pathways is compromised. We had known for a while that something was wrong. Had noticed that, you know, Gregory'd had some, some symptoms for ages, including these blood pressure ups and downs, and he'd had some, some urinary issues as well. So he kind of knew something was wrong, but he kept going to specialists and they kept saying that it, they couldn't find anything. I remember having a short conversation with Kate then and we knew, we, we knew there was something wrong, it just hadn't been figured out yet. Imagine losing all your physical mobility a gradual but unforgiving decline. You stop being able to walk. Then you can no longer sit or stand without assistance. Then your arms stop following your instructions and only respond sporadically to your commands. And so it goes on. You know, we were in our 50s and you do start to think that things might go wrong. And so he started to have urinary problems and things like that. But they weren't that specific. And he just got on and, you know, made appointments with the GP and things. It wasn't really in, until he started falling and having problems in that respect that it became, became worrying to me. It's a lot less common than Parkinson's disease. If you take 100 people with Parkinsonism, about two or three have MSA. So it's that kind of ratio. If someone presents with Parkinsonism, the most likely explanation is Parkinson's disease. If someone presents with balance problems, there's a whole range of other disorders that can cause balance difficulties. So it's only over a period of time that the clinical picture emerges that someone has a degenerative process that fits the, the diagnostic criteria for MSA. I had a funny feeling. So Gregory used to go to the consultants on his own. And this one time I said, I'm coming with you. Because I just had a funny feeling. And the consultant hadn't said, we've got a diagnosis or whatever. But I went. He was a general neurologist. And he said MSA. And, you know, obviously next to lots of hospitals, there's often a, a graveyard. And we went and sat in the graveyard and just held hands. And I suppose it, there was a bit of relief. We knew what it was. And you just don't really, you know, however, however well educated you are in health, as I am, I'm well trained, you just don't really understand that concept that your life is just going to, your lives are going to be completely destroyed. Uh, my name is Rita. Um, I am the daughter of my father, which is Gregory Wilson, who is suffering from MSA. I didn't understand it. I thought it was just, it was just a diagnosis, you know? You're depressed or you maybe, you have this or that. And, but I, I never knew it was 
it deteriorated someone. Yeah, it's just, it's frustrating. Because we could have done so much within that year. But um, that's something that we have to live with and get through it. I am exhausted already, and the day has barely begun. Constant fatigue is a feature of MSA. All-nighters studying at Stamford were never like this. Everything is a massive effort, and everything is very, very slow. This is, uh, this is my worry book. Um, uh, Kate, the school that I'm going to right now, gave me this. So these are my worries. Um, I think a lot of them are just, I don't know, teenage worries. Um, me being sick, my legs and spine getting paralyzed. I get scared when, when, I, when people die. A lot of people die in my dreams, people I love. I always feel vulnerable in a sling. It feels like I'm awaiting torture by some 1980s South American regime. The furthest I've ever voyaged in this is the three yards from my bed to the wheelchair. Manufacturers seem to delight in choosing inappropriate brand names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fine. Okay? Fine? Good. Um. When I say to someone that I'm struggling, and then somebody else replies saying that we all struggle. I, I get so jealous when people say that. I, I don't know if it's because I feel like my struggle is more important than theirs. Or is it because I hate the feeling that we all have to go through struggle? I don't know. It's like some people are clinically depressed or have bipolar and some people are disabled. Showers, which used to be a refreshing 10 minute start to the day, are now a two hour, two person chore that gets done twice a week if we're lucky. The morning routine you have just witnessed takes about three hours daily, and I spend long periods waiting for caregivers to be ready to help me. Truly, MSA is an exercise in patience and humility. This illness has made me appreciate how delicate a mechanism the human body is, how many things can go wrong with it, and how much we should value it when it is healthy. So I do CrossFit. I've started about six months ago, at the very end of year eight, when things weren't going so well. There's a lot of mental toughness, and it's very well-rounded, the, the crowd just cheering on for the last person who's crossed the line. That is huge for me. But um, me doing CrossFit, that's standing up for my dreams, that's standing up for a peace of mind. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's standing up for help. I need help here. And um, I really need help. And the problem is that she went to secondary school, huge shock. Her father got diagnosed and started to go downhill. Huge shock. We had to um, modify the house because he couldn't live in it. He had to move downstairs. Huge shock. So all of those things, and I was still working, it, you know, it was too much, really. Well, I guess, first of all, the thing about Gregory that 
everybody knows is that he's very intelligent. I remember that he had a um, IQ test when he was at school and um, they said he came out as genius level. He was obsessed with the, with the underground, with the tube maps. He used to do all these drawings. Um, they were careful, detailed and completely accurate drawings. Same as you might see in, in a tube station and he knew them all off by heart. He could, if you said, what are the stations on the circle line? He could recite them all. But he used to escape from home, so remember he was under eight, um, and he used to go riding around on the underground trains, and it used to drive our mother mad, and she used to really worry about him, but after a bit she knew where he'd probably disappeared to, and she'd go and wait for him at the station. We used to go away on holiday to a farm in Kent. What they did was take kids in for holiday stays and we always went together and I used to feel like I needed to look out for him a little bit because he was younger than me and sometimes other kids that were there would tease him a little bit. Our favourite thing, there was a sort of ditch around each field with water in it um, and it was sort of sunk down and there were trees growing over it and we called it the secret glade and we used to paddle through it in our Wellington boots and sometimes catch um, silverfish and things. I do remember him getting into a lot of trouble at school. So, as a parent, I now really empathise with my mother, um, who had to get these phone calls. Gregory's got hold of um, the housemaster's keys and he's got copies of all of them, and he doesn't seem to realise that it's a problem. And my mother had to do a lot of um, smoothing down and explaining how he had been led astray by the other boys. <laughs> This, these, these are the memoirs of the headmaster that was headmaster at Westminster School when Gregory was at school. Gregory Wilsden arrives at my door. With his Oxford scholarship won and time on his hands, he is producing Oscar Wilde's play Salome. He wants to know whether the girl who is to play Salome may end her dance naked. I say no. Being Gregory, he doesn't take no for an answer. Do I realise that the dance is supposed to be erotic? His intellectual analysis of the importance of nudity to the play sounds strange coming from this rather introvert classical scholar, but I decline to change my mind. I must protect the girl, and I know all too well how many critics in the common room would react if I allowed the dance to go ahead as Gregory wishes. <laughs> it's too good. I did hear that he was, uh, you know, like many teenagers, in fact, um, I'd probably sympathise because I'd been a bit like that myself when I was at school in London, um, that he, uh, you know, he, um, he tested the boundaries a little bit. <laughs> he was among the, um, I would say, the high flyers of the school. He was a Queen's Scholar in Westminster. Uh, even in, in that really quite uh, intellectually elite little community, he was a leader himself. He was, in fact, the top scholar. Both Gregor and I had sort of similar situations where we had active social lives, lots of friends, but we weren't meeting anybody new. And it was the very early days of internet dating, so there weren't dating sites. It was, you know, you had a news page, and then on the news page there was maybe, like, personal columns, like you'd get in the newspaper. And uh, he put an advert up, and I answered it, and poor man thought he'd turned the tap on, and there were hundreds of women would come flocking, um, and I was the first. He liked opera, I like opera. He liked books. We were very, very similar in many ways, and we just enjoyed each other's company. We were 41 when um, we got married, and that's very late to have a child. And I was basically told, you can't have IVF, you can't have anything, which was great because it, it put a very strong line, you know, you cannot do any of those things. So we didn't waste years trying to have our own children. And I had always been in favor of adoption. We wanted to grow a family. So we were told our only alternative was to go abroad. <clears throat> and Gregory is half Russian. So we went to Russia and adopted Rita. I was a teacher. I taught Latin and Greek at Westminster Abbey Choir School and St. Paul's Girls' School. Teaching was my whole life, and I used to imagine doing it, in a small way, into old age. I think the thing is actually the experience of, of teaching, the reward of seeing that, that spark in your pupils as they catch on to something or respond to something, um, was something that he, he really enjoyed. Yes, I, I, I 
well remember meeting him the first time. He came as a recommendation from a colleague at Westminster School. And immediately you could see he was a remarkable person, passionate about classics, passionate about teaching Latin, slightly unconventional in the very best possible way. And I thought, yes, actually, he would have a huge amount just to bring, uh, not just in what he taught, but in the way in which he taught it. What's remarkable about Gregory is that he is a great academic and he is brilliant at talking to and inspiring those who are at the sort of top end in terms of school, classical scholarship. But at the same time, he really relishes introducing classics to those for whom it's new. He really does have a way with young people, uh, which is not always the case with, you know, highly qualified and highly gifted scholars. The teaching to Gregory was terribly, terribly important. It was something that just made him feel he'd found his niche. He's probably the best teacher I ever had. I think I probably learned the most from him. He kind of lifts his students up and he works with you on your strengths and weaknesses. He never gave up on anyone. He always would see the best in people and where one would say to him, um, Gregory, I wonder if he's going to reach level three at, at some Latin. Gregory would always say, oh, well, let's just see. I, th I think he will, I think he will. Um, so he, he always believed in absolutely everybody. Of all the things I miss from my old life, I miss the classroom the most. I loved teaching, and I managed, through various methods, to continue to teach until my voice finally gave out. It, it seemed something and nothing to begin with. And I can't quite remember when it, when it was that we first noticed it, but uh, the deterioration happened quite rapidly. There was a physical weakening, perhaps a slowing down. Um, nothing um, cognitive or intellectual, but just physical. We knew that there was something very seriously wrong. I don't know if we had expected it to be quite so wrong. I was very frightened whenever he got, went out, because there were some occasions when he would completely, his body would shut down, but he's still awake. He's, he knows what he's doing, but he can't control when he trips or fall. And there's a few occasions when he tripped in the middle of the road. And that was very, that was very frightening. Um, and I, I think for that, I feel a bit safer that he's in a wheelchair. The loss of my ability to yeah. communicate started slowly. First, my handwriting became so cramped it was illegible. Never mind, I thought. I'll mark my work on the computer instead. My pupils were delighted. They had never seen such clear comments from me before. Then my typing got worse. No problem, I thought. I'll use dictation software. Then my voice got weaker. OK, I thought, I'll use an amplifier. But the MSA attacked not only the volume, but the articulation. Control of my lips and tongue was gradually failing. Very well, I thought, I'll synthesize my voice. But the voice synthesis software required me to record 1,600 sentences. My voice gave out after 945. The synthesized voice sounded like this. Maybe this voice will sound familiar to you. Not very intelligible, I thought. I'll try one of the built-in system voices. But slowly typing sentences is incompatible with contributing to a conversati on. I didn't want to sound like that, so I gave up on the dictation software. Garbage in, garbage out. The IT department were helping him to use his um, iPad to speak to uh, the, the, the smart board in the teaching room so that, you know, he could use technology to help. And we managed to arrange for him to teach by Skype and FaceTime and so forth, which he did incredibly effectively. It was rather like chasing a rainbow because as things were put in place or replaced for him, then something else in his condition would manifest itself. I am anyway finding it increasingly difficult to focus my vision on a computer screen. I am reduced to selecting from an on-screen keyboard until my mouse control gets too bad. I think he just felt that actually the voice, 
his energy levels, um, his ability to go on communicating um, really effectively with the boys was getting to a stage when he simply had to give in to it. And he said, I don't know how the year will proceed and I must think of my pupils. I've been living in New Zealand and he's been living in England. So once I knew about that diagnosis, I, I decided to come over, um, you know, as often as I could. Um, and I think I've been over about once a year for the last three years. Um, and each time there's been a, a change, um, quite a dramatic change for the worse, that the progress of his disease has been quite scary. Then one day he said to me, he'd lifted up his arms, he was doing his exercises, he's put his arms down and he said, could you move my elbow? And I remember being absolutely shocked, thinking, you cannot move your elbow, you just can't move it. And it was, it was a horrible moment, really. Um, I think, I think his deterioration is punctuated by moments like that. In 2017, the Stamford class of 88, where I studied for my MBA, raised about $73,000 in a fund to support me. A year later, they raised still more. This allowed my wife, Kate, to become my main caregiver. Bonus, she is a trained nurse. I think if you're not trained, then you think, oh, what if he chokes, or what if he does this, or what if, you know, whereas been there, done that, you know, yes, bad things can happen, but I, I feel I've got the wherewithal to be able to cope with most situations. The money raised for me has allowed her to take an unpaid leave of absence from her job. It is hard physical work, but we both prefer it to a stranger performing the role. However, it has reached the stage where additional caregivers are also necessary. Crushing the pills. He's got um, a tube goes into his stomach. With MSA, you have problems swallowing later on, and also it's a huge effort because when you swallow, you don't realise, but when you swallow, you stop breathing. And for someone who's compromised breathing, then that's a problem. I flush the tube, I give him medication through the tube, and then I move him to his desk where he's got his computer and he can very, very slowly email and do various things. This incredibly useful device is my work desk, dining table, and much else besides. People often ask me what I am doing with my time. The answer frequently is staying alive. There have been no great works of literature, no philosophical insights. Most of my time is taken up with untangling the host of companies and other structures through which we have provided our services. The tremors in my arm stop me from performing the activities I once took for granted. Tremors can start without warning and they turn my hands into one of those fairground amusements in which you try to manipulate a claw arm to pick up a prize, with about the same chance of success. No wonder I'm exhausted all the time. Movement is a constant frustration. It's like not having the strength to do certain things, such as lifting your arm. While a tremor can mean I can't stop moving my arm, just not the way I want it to. Food presents particular problems. MSA typically attacks the swallowing function, necessitating the insertion of a gastric tube. I have so far avoided major swallowing difficulties. My problems are more to do with getting the food into my mouth. I used to be able to eat with fingers or a spoon, but now I must be fed by others. It is a very intimate experience that poses unexpected challenges. Mouthfuls too large. Mouthfuls too small. Too fast. Too slow. It is humbling that I need help with this most basic of human activities. The doctors can't treat the underlying disease, but they can treat some of the symptoms. MSA, as its name suggests, attacks many different bodily functions. So I take a lot of drugs. 
There is also a seemingly interminable line of physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, wheelchair technicians, phlebotomists, GPs, district nurses, palliative nurses and counsellors, not to mention the queue of friends whose unspoken objective is to see me before I die. And I needed then to translate because his speech is so poor now that most people can't understand it. Dementia is seldom a feature of MSA, but you would not believe it considering how some people treat me. The moment I went into a wheelchair, and even more since my voice became impaired, I have found myself subject to the does he take sugar syndrome, where questions and discussions, even from medical professionals who should know better, are directed at the able-bodied person accompanying rather than the person in the wheelchair. There's a tendency when you are not communicating easily with somebody to sort of talk as if they're only half there. So I, when I know, and I've noticed this when I've, there've been other people as well, sometimes talking not directly to him, but <laughs> expecting Kate to put the question to him because they might then understand the answer better or they might get an order. Um, this must be very frustrating and quite hurtful to Gregory, I think. Nearly everything we have is on wheels now. It makes for the best use of space. But still, Kate is faced every morning and evening with performing a valet parking service. When even one's bowel movements have to be scheduled, there is no room for spontaneity in one's life. However, the trousers still have to be got down. Kate had yet another of her ingenious solutions, presenting the Wilsden line of bottomless trousers. MSA attacks your internal muscles as well as those you can see. Now, I require an enema every second day to help assist my bowel movement. This goes into Gregory's rectum and a balloon is blown up. And that holds it in place and then water comes up and goes up the colon and in theory washes the feces down. You can't really prepare yourself for having a rod inserted into your bottom. Are you ready, love? You ready? My lower intestines are flushed with water, a plastic balloon inflates inside me, and, well, shit happens. <laughs> What's that sound? Don't laugh. You push it out. Stop laughing. Gregory! Gregory! I'm gonna have to... Genius! Oh, <laughs> really? Well, look what you made me do now. What? Well, obviously you pushed the catheter out. Um, okay, I get to put it up again, all right? In the videos, it all looks very clean and nice and lovely. In reality, it's none of those things. Right. Yeah. Have you quite got your... <laughs> you need to stop laughing, Gregory. You're not supposed to laugh. No, I'm serious. All right. Can you be serious? Think of the Labour Party manifesto or Brexit that will make you depressed. Right. Ready? Yeah. All right. Okay. We're done. At least I also have time for some light reading. Yeah. 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Oh. Ring your bell when you're done. problem charging and we ended up using it. It's chilly outside, Gregory. 
I don't know if you want a hat. It is getting harder to leave the house. It generates an extra burden for Kate, who has to do everything from preparing my going out bag to getting me into Gloria. Gloria was built on the shell of a transit van, hence her name, which is a complicated pun on sic transit Gloria Mundi, a Latin phrase which means thus passes the glory of the world, a formula used in papal coronations. In Gloria, I can almost feel like a normal passenger. Going out brings fresh air and a welcome change of scene. But the effort required takes its toll. So mostly I stay at home, confined to the bottom floor of our house. My view now consists of looking out the window onto our modest backyard. My world is getting smaller. By, by seven o'clock, the aim is to have supper by seven o'clock, so I cook or prepare the meals. I don't have time to cook most of the time, but and we eat at seven. The Gregory used to cook fantastic meals and we used to, oh, they were always late, but they, they were fantastic meals and we'd sit for hours around the table and chat. That's the hardest part. Um, so we watch the telly for an hour and he, I feed him, feed myself. And then after that, it's getting him to bed. So Rita helps me lift, get him lifted into bed because when he's in the sling, one person can manage him, but to get him on and off the sling, you need two people. So get him into bed, and then get Rita to bed. I'd change this, put water in the CPAP machine, clean his teeth, um, and lie him down flat. He does a few small arm exercises, and then I go to bed. How she would have been if her father had been well is a bit difficult to tell, really. Um, there's definitely issues around that, huge issues around that. Um, but I think it's all in the melting pot. It's a she. I love her. She's just woken up. She's really cute. That's a bit sad to say this, but I don't really have much friends. You know, like, real friends. You know, it's very hard, like, I do quite a lot, as you know, and, like, just to know that I can just cut off a little bit and know that this hamster doesn't have to do any work. <laughs> but it's OK, you know? This hamster only has to run around on a wheel for seven miles, eight, and uh, make herself all cosy in our little house. I don't look forward to much on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not much of a life. The reason I choose not to give up is for my daughter. As everything is taken away from me, I remind myself of this choice I still have. You sort of think, oh, Gregory's got MSA, we need to cope with that. But actually, the whole family get it. You know, it, it completely destroyed our lives. Um, so I think even if Gregory was in a nursing home and I wasn't working so hard to look after him, it would still impact your your life so completely that it overwhelms it. Um, I, I do try to ignore him half the time. I do look upon to my mother a lot more. Because um, she's the one she can speak. She can talk, you know, she can... Um, 
I did not realize how dependent I was upon being able to speak, from affectionate nothings to keep Kate's spirits up, to dropping pearls of wisdom in front of my teenage daughter, who is struggling. Not having a voice is the hardest part of living with MSA. Of course, it's literally true, but also metaphorically. I'm excluded from decisions and human interaction because it is too difficult to make out what I am saying. Even before his communication became very hard to understand, he couldn't um, articulate enough to have a full conversation or a discussion. That meant that it was more difficult for him to fulfill his role as a parent, and I know that it, that really upset him. So this is for the um, ADFAM letters. So ADFAM is ad familiaris, which is Cicero. So that's, um, of course, Latin. Well, he was Roman, and he used to write letters to his family and extended friends. And so that's what I do. I write a letter every week to family and extended friends. Where is it? And I do it for several reasons. I do it because um, lots of friends and family want to know how Gregory is. Um, and then I do it because I want Rita to have some understanding and history and, and record of what was going on when in such a difficult time and through her childhood. And also it makes me feel, it makes me look back at the week and think, okay, it wasn't so bad and try and, I don't put it, I don't make it a Facebook or Instagram. I do tell the truth, but I do try and put a more positive spin on it. Not just for the people I'm writing to, but because of me, because I don't want to get bogged down in the drama and the sadness of everything. I want it to be okay. It's just that constant feeling if we could just stop a button and just, you know, let's, let's go out. You know, without the struggle, put my father into the wheelchair or getting changed and just go out and have an ice cream and just hug, you know, personal time. I miss that. It's a struggle to see him when I see other dads who are able to move and go around and show their kids, this is how you be an adult. My biggest concerns now are for Kate and Rita. It guts me that I won't be around to see Rita grow up and help her through the difficult times. I'm good with adolescence, and the deal with Kate was always that I would take the lead here. But right now, I don't know if I should be a child. I don't know if I should be a teenager. And there's some moments when I start whining or crying in front of him because I don't know what emotion I'm meant to be in. You know, I don't know how to express my love. Rita, my darling girl, talking to you is difficult now that my speech is so incomprehensible. I would like you to remember your father, not as I am now, but as the big, strong papa who fixed things and solved problems, who carried you on his shoulders and cooked delicious meals for you and mama. When I am gone, you may remember episodes when you behaved badly toward me. I want you to know that these things don't matter at all to me. And I recognize that they are simply signs of anger and sadness at my condition. All I can think is that my brave and powerful girl has been given this fate because she has the strength to deal with it. Remember that you are Rita Wilsdon, and you have an inner strength that will see you through this and other crises. You are the apple of my eye and the center of my universe, as you were the day I met you. I think there are two, two sorts of grief. One part is that you're grieving that he's going to die, and that is hard. But I hadn't appreciated that actually I would lose him while he was still alive. Gregory and I are just managing the condition now. We're not enjoying life or having a life. We're trying to make a life for Rita, but it's hard for her. So you have to grab life when you can before it all happens because it Oh, it's devastating. I feel as if I'm letting both of them down. There's nothing I should like more now than to go on a long country walk with Kate. It is truly the simple things with the people you love that often matter the most. I think he has the most wonderful laugh. And I remember the first time his face creased up in laughter. I just thought, well, I think that's when I fell in love with him. He's just lovely laugh. 
We had wonderful holidays, really wonderful, and I will always, always remember them. But also, he, he's just, he was so strong and made such a wonderful husband. And I suppose that's what makes it so hard now. My darling Kate, my love, what can I say? To part from you is awful. But I have to look back at 17 years of happiness and think they were so wonderful. They were far and away the best period of my life. I know it is all too easy to rage at God or fate for not granting us another 30 years, but many people do not have what we had. Live in the present and know that if you are happy, I am happy. It is normal amid the feelings of sadness to feel relief when I have died at not having the huge burden of my care. And it is also normal to feel guilty about such feelings. You need not worry about them. Your care has been fantastic. I have learnt so much from you. How to love and be loved primarily, which is possibly the most important lesson of human existence. I love you so much. And if I have any existence after I am dead, you can be sure that I will watch over you and Rita and protect you. I have a MSA. So it's a lot to store my voice, voice, but you, you won't be here much for me going forward. In the morning, when Gregory woke up, he obviously wasn't very well. He deteriorated during the morning. And I so don't know when I realised he was dying. He didn't want to go to hospital. He made that very clear. Um, and I think I sort of didn't quite let it be. I, I, you know, I didn't clearly think he's dying because I didn't want that. And I think I just suppressed that. I just thought, we have to get through this. But then it became obvious that he was dying and, uh, and he died that afternoon. I, I knew at the time and I know now that I didn't want him to have to live with MSA. One of the things that has helped me cope with this is knowing that he was ready. I actually was in contact um, through FaceTime uh, a few hours before his death, but when we knew he wasn't well and we knew he did not want to go to hospital. And he said, it's all right. And I said, do you mean it's all right that it might be the end? And couldn't really say any more, but Kate said, squeeze my hand. Squeeze my hand for yes, if that's what it is. And he did. And so what I knew from that when he, when he did die was that he was ready to go. He was more than ready to go. And he was not afraid. 
And I think that it's often that way for people with conditions like this. And perhaps that is some very small comfort for us that are left behind. I knew that he couldn't continue as he was. He wasn't getting any better, he was only getting worse. He could practically, he could hardly talk by then, and it was terrible for him. But while he was still there, it was like he was still there. He was still my Gregory. And when he went, the black hole was huge. A few weeks ago, I had a dream. I dreamed that we were back at the farm that we used to go to on holiday. And I woke up from that and I just, I felt a sort of quite a piercing sadness for the loss and the waste and, and the not, and the not being able to stop it from happening. But I think grief's like that. I think you kind of get used to what's happened and adjust a bit, but then every so long, something reminds you, maybe unexpectedly, and it really gets to you. Well, she's 14. I, I think the problems, the problem is not just his death, but before his death, because he wasn't able to hug her and hold her and, and talk to her um, for the past couple of years. And that has had a devastating effect on her. She was very close to him and she's found that very hard. This is how I feel half the time. Um, and I feel like I've got to, sometimes I've got like the side when I'm very mature and then the side where I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know, I'll start to tick or maybe I'll start to, my voice will change and, and I don't know what this is. She misses him terribly. She's become very concerned that something will happen to me and also very, um, she wants to look after me and be the man of the house. Um, all of which is just to be understood. I'm sure that that's all part of the grief. So I talked to him a little bit about life and death and um, he said he felt quite angry that he wouldn't be around for his daughter, Rita, for as long as he would have hoped, or for his wife. Um, but he also said that if he didn't have a family, he might have chosen to end his life. But he also continued to say, I wouldn't do that because I think it would be too tough on Kate and Rita and that he'd made a living will about treatment and whether he should be having life-saving measures. His choice, if it was just for him, would have been, no, you know, don't prolong my life by artificial means. But what he'd actually put in the will is, um, do whatever my um, wife and daughter, whatever is best for them. I found this place and it, um, it's a, they take his ashes, a small amount of ashes, and they, Put them into a swirl of green glass or any colour glass you like and you end up with a globe that has Gregory's ashes in it and what I like about it is that we have something so when we talk about big things with Rita um, there's what would Papa think you know here's a, a physical manifestation of you know a memory and when she's feeling bad I say we're all together and you know it's a little bit of Gregory and it's a little bit of Gregory for me too we had a wonderful, wonderful marriage. I just wish it had carried on, but we were lucky. I, I walk down here quite a bit, just because um, for me, I think me walking for a graveyard, and especially down here where it's really old, is just, I, I realize how appreciated I am. I think as a kid, you just think that everything's given to you. And then when you get into your teens, that's when you start to realise that it's not just about you. One day I'm going to die, you know? I think we all have to realise that we're all dying at the same time. And... Um, and this is the thing, I, I don't want to be one of these people who just wastes my talent away. If this illness has taught me anything, it's do it now. Whatever it is, a place you've always wanted to visit, an activity you've always wanted to try, someone to whom you've always wanted to say, I love you, do it now. Time is the scarce resource in life, not money. Money can always be found somewhere, but our time here on Earth is necessarily limited and maybe shorter than we think. So use your time wisely 
even stingily. Time spent doing nothing with loved ones is not time wasted. Who you do things with is as important as what you do. There is a significant chance that I will be dead by the time you watch this. So believe me, don't leave it till tomorrow. You may not have a tomorrow. Do it now. I would that we were, my beloved, white birds on the foam of the sea. We tire of the flame of the meteor before it can fade and flee, and the flame of the blue star of twilight hung low on the rim of the sky has awakened in our hearts, my beloved, a sadness that may not die. Our weariness comes from those dreamers, dew-dappled, the lily and rose. Ah, dream not of them, my beloved, the flame of the meteor that goes, or the flame of the blue star that lingers, hung low in the pool of the dew. For I would we were changed to white birds on the wandering foam, I and you. I am haunted by numberless islands and many a Danaean shore, where time would surely forget us and sorrow come near us no more. Soon, far from the rose and the lily, and the fret of the flames would we be, were we only white birds, my beloved, buoyed out on the foam of the sea. If you're still here, thank you for taking the time to watch glimpses. If you want to support those affected by MSA, I've provided links to donate in the description. And if you'd like to see the making of the film, you can check out the link to my documentary masterclass detailing the process. And if you just want to support the film, uh, the best thing you can do is follow the IMDb link in the description to write a review for it. Uh, this helps to raise its online profile and allows more people to find and watch it. Thank you again for your support.